All right, here we are at episode six of Everything You Need to Know About JPEG. This episode is on the inverse discrete cosine transform. Like usual, before we jump right into the code for this step, what we really need to do is gain a much better intuition for how the inverse discrete cosine transform works. Hopefully you remember this image from episode one. Each of these 64 images represents a possible image pattern, and the DCT coefficient at each of these positions represents the contribution of that particular pattern with respect to the actual color data. So for a single color component of a single MCU, if you scale all 64 of these images by their respective DCT coefficients and then sum all of those 64 images together, what you end up with is the final color data for that color component of that MCU. But I think for this to really make sense, we need to look directly at the data that we're dealing with. So for now, let's just take this image here and let's just make a JPEG that is eight by eight pixels and looks exactly like this. So here we go, here's that JPEG. It's one single MCU. It's completely grayscale, so there is no CB or CR data. And the luminance data looks exactly like one of those 64 images. So what should we predict about this image when we run it through our decoder? Well, since its color data is perfectly explained by this image here, then we expect the DCT coefficient in this location to be very large. And since none of the other images are needed to explain the image, we expect their DCT coefficients to be zero. Let's see if that's true. So if we run this on the eight by eight image, which I've named one.jpg, it starts with an APPN marker, followed by both the quantization tables, the start of frame, four Huffman tables, and the start of scan. So a very straightforward JPEG file. So here is one.jpg, and here is the corresponding one.bmp. Let's take a closer look. So here is one.bmp, and what we're seeing is the entire MCU is black or zero, except for one pixel, which corresponds to the position of the image that we started with in this image here. And remember that the red comes from the luminance, while the green and blue components are zero because there is no chrominance in the original image. But I think things will make even more sense if we are looking at the actual numbers. So here, after we dequantize, let's just print the content of the MCU. That way we can see the actual DCT coefficients. And let's just throw that in right here. This code is really not important because it's very temporary. We just want to print all 64 values in the first MCU of the image. And this does match our predictions. The coefficients for both of the chrominance channels are all zero, and all but one coefficient for the luminance channel is zero. Now remember that the first coefficient, the DC coefficient, represents the overall brightness of the MCU. So it's kind of interesting there's a zero here. It kind of makes sense. If you think about the average brightness of all of these pixels, we have some in the middle that are a middle gray, and we have both extremes with bright white and dark black on the sides. So it all averages out, so the average brightness is about middle gray. So what we learned is that a DC coefficient of zero means the average brightness is medium brightness. Hopefully what that means is we can increase or decrease the brightness of this image, and we will see that reflected in the DC coefficient. So let's go ahead and crank up the brightness and overwrite one.jpg. Now if we run this again, now we see a very large number as the DC coefficient, indicating that the MCU is very bright. 
As far as the image pattern goes, this is still the only non-zero coefficient because the image data is perfectly explained by this one pattern. Likewise, we can decrease the brightness and overwrite one.jpg. Now, when we rerun this, we see a very large negative number as the DC coefficient, indicating the MCU is very dark, and again, only one non-zero AC coefficient. Here's one more important thing to point out about how these image patterns work. We see this image here with all vertical stripes of a single color with white on the left and black on the right. But none of these 64 images show vertical stripes with black on the left and white on the right. So what if that is what our image looked like? Here we can flip the image so that the black is on the left and overwrite one.jpg. And now we have a very large negative number for that same AC coefficient. So here with respect to the DC coefficient, a positive number means an overall lighter MCU and a negative number means an overall darker MCU. But with the AC coefficients, a positive number means a positive contribution or a direct contribution. And a negative number means a negative or inverted contribution. Knowing all of that, knowing that we can control the brightness and use any combination of the other 63 images along with their inverse, we can use all of this information to create any possible 8x8 MCU that we want. So here's the real question. Let's go back to our first image we started with. Here is the luminance data for the MCU in terms of discrete cosine transform coefficients. How do we convert this to an MCU with the correct luminance data for all eight of these columns? In other words, how do we transform this matrix into this matrix? With just this one piece of information, we need to be able to fill each of these columns with the correct color. Now we really get into why cosine. Why is cosine a part of this process at all? Let's hone in on the image that corresponds to this DCT coefficient. So here is that image again. Let's make a plot where we graph the X position or the column number on the X axis. And on the Y axis, let's graph the column's color where white is one, black is negative one, and middle gray is zero. So if we plot this near perfect white, that will be basically at one. This next column will be about here. The third column will be about here. As we get to the fourth and fifth column, we get very close to middle gray. And I'll go ahead and plot the last four. Now my crude drawing isn't perfect, but this gives you a pretty good idea of how it's supposed to look. And you might notice that this isn't exactly linear. In other words, the delta from column to column, or how much it decreases by, is not a constant amount. Between column four and five, the value decreases by 50. But on the edges, here and here, it only decreases by about 20. So if we connect the dots, you can see this looks a lot like part of a cosine graph. And that's exactly the idea. The idea is that this is a cosine graph with a very low frequency. It takes a long time to transition from white to black. Compared to this image here, which represents a cosine wave with a much higher frequency. It oscillates back and forth between white and black many times within a single MCU. So what do we know about the equation of a cosine? Well, in the most basic form, we know y equals cosine of x will give us a simple cosine wave that oscillates from one to negative one. That's just the basic cosine, but how can we modify this equation? Here's a basic graph of y equals cosine of x. 
So what can we do to modify or parameterize this equation? One thing we can do is multiply the entire equation by some constant, which changes the amplitude of the wave. We can change this constant to zero, which flattens the entire cosine wave into a straight line. This constant that we multiply by is like the DCT coefficient in our MCU. This is saying that the cosine wave that corresponds to this location has an amplitude essentially of 722 and the amplitude of every other cosine wave is zero. In other words, they do not contribute to the image. This should also show why negative numbers invert black and white. If we multiply the coefficient by negative one, we have flipped the graph upside down. The other thing we can do to this graph is multiply x by some coefficient to control the frequency of the wave. As we double this coefficient, we double the frequency. Now if this coefficient here is like our DCT coefficients in the MCU, this coefficient here is like the x and y position of each coefficient in the MCU. Larger x values correspond to higher frequencies. So how do we use this DCT coefficient data to calculate this color data? Well, for every one of the pixel values that we want to calculate, for all 64 of them, its value is the sum of the contributions of 64 cosine waves. So you can guess that's going to be quite a bit of computation. For all 64 positions, we need to sum 64 cosine waves. There will be some optimizations that we can end up doing that we'll discuss in a little bit. Because all of these coefficients are zero aside from one of them, our summation will end up being this one cosine wave plus 63 other cosine waves that all have an amplitude of zero. For now, let's see what happens when we sum two cosine waves instead of 64. When we sum two identical cosine waves, all that does is double the amplitude or double the y value at every point. However, the waves that we will be summing will have different frequencies. The amplitude will be controlled by the DCT coefficient, so those could be any value, but the frequency of each wave will be dependent on the X and Y coordinate in the MCU. Now the numbers I'm using are not realistic. They're not the same as what will be used in the actual calculations, but the effect is the same over here. So let's say we're summing the cosine wave for some cosine with a lower frequency and adding that to the cosine wave which has a higher frequency. So if we add two cosine waves, one which has four times the frequency as the other, this is the resulting graph, at least whenever the weights of the two waves are equal. What if we say the weight of the first wave is 10 times greater than the weight of the second. We can also make one of these weights negative. You can already see how this produces pretty complex waves and we're only adding two, not even close to the full 64. So now what we really need is the summation formula that tells us exactly how to sum all 64 cosine functions given their amplitude, the actual DCT coefficient, and given the X and Y position in the MCU, or in other words, the frequency of the wave. For that, we can turn to good old Wikipedia. Here on the page, all about the discrete cosine transform, there are many examples of different kinds of DCT functions. The primary one used by JPEG compression or JPEG encoding is DCT number two. And DCT number three is the inverse of DCT number two. So DCT number three is the one that we need. However, this explanation here is a one-dimensional DCT. We need a two-dimensional DCT. Wikipedia has this whole section on multidimensional DCTs. Here they show the 2D example of 
DCT number two, which is not the one we're using right now. You know it's 2D because there are exactly two summations. So however, this goes from the 1D DCT number two to the 2D DCT number two is the same change we have to make to go from the 1D DCT number three to the 2D DCT number three, which is not shown here on Wikipedia. Plus, there are more details about how JPEG specifically uses DCT, like some additional factors and other things that play into the calculation that are not shown here. But I think this video is going to be long enough even without dissecting this summation. So if you want to dissect it, feel free. But I'm going to cut to the chase a little bit about how we need to use it. So let's start by writing the summation algorithm in a little bit of pseudocode. I already implied that we need to loop through every pixel. So you can assume there will be some nested for loop for y and x. So for y and x going from 0 to 8, inside this nested for loop, we will calculate the color for one pixel, pixel xy. To do that, we have to sum all 64 cosine functions. So let's initialize sum to 0. Now we need another nested for loop. Since we're already using y and x, let's just call them i and j. So now we use i, j as the coordinates of a discrete cosine transform coefficient, or a weight of one of the 64 cosines. And we use that weight to scale some cosine function and then add that to our sum. But it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. This is the DC coefficient ij. We also need to multiply this by two other coefficients, one that depends on i and one that depends on j, but we'll talk about those in a little bit. And because this is a 2d DCT and not 1d, we multiply this by two different cosine functions. So this here handles the amplitude or weight of the cosine, and whatever we need to put inside here will handle the frequency. So the two cosine functions that are included account for the two dimensions. So one of them uses x and j, which if you think about it, they kind of correspond to each other. x is the inner of this nested for loop and j is the inner of this nested for loop and the second cosine function is y and i the two multiplier and the plus one as well as the extra constant here times pi over 16 are just part of the definition of the jpeg inverse dct and i apologize i'm kind of trying to fit too much on screen at a time but the last part is after this nested for loop is finished, sum is divided by 4. After this, the value of sum is the pixel intensity for pixel xy. The only thing left is to talk about where ci and cj come from. Well, by default, they're both equal to 1, but only in the case where i is equal to 0, Instead, then ci equals 1 over the square root of 2. And same thing with cj. If j is equal to 0, then cj equals 1 over the square root of 2. Just one more really important thing to point out about how this has to be done. Once we get the sum of all 64 cosines for a single pixel xy, we can't simply write the sum directly back to the MCU at position xy because for the rest of this nested for loop, we will continue reading from our MCU. Basically, this array of DCT coefficients is our MCU component. That's where the DCT coefficients are stored. But we need to be able to read all 64 DCT coefficients for the entire duration of this nested for loop. So when we calculate a final sum, we cannot overwrite the corresponding DCT coefficient at xy. 
Otherwise, we will be unable to correctly calculate all following pixels. So all that means is we have to store these resulting sums somewhere else. Then when this is all said and done, we can copy all of the sums, all of the color intensities back to our MCU component. Okay, so let's give this a shot and implement all of this in our decoder. Let's start by undoing this print MCU thing. After we dequantize all the MCUs, we want to perform inverse DCT on all the MCUs. Then let's add this inverse DCT function below the dequantize function. We're going to use the exact same pattern that we used for dequantization, which is for every MCU and for every component in that MCU, we'll perform inverse DCT on a component. So we need this inverse DCT component function. And this is going to follow very closely with the pseudocode we just wrote. Like I said before, we want to store the result of all of the sums into a separate array. That way we don't overwrite the DCT coefficients as we compute. We want to loop for y and x. For every pixel in the MCU, we want to calculate the sum. And to do that, we need to loop through all DCT coefficients ij. We need to determine the values of ci and cj based on whether or not i and j are 0. And to get square root, we need to include CMath. Now we just need to add to sum based on x, y, i, j, ci, and cj. There we go, I know it's not that pretty. At the end of this nested for loop, we have finished calculating the sum, but we need to divide it by four. And we can store this final value in our result array. Last but not least, we need to write the entire result array to the component array when we are done with the entire quadrupled nested for loop. So there we go. Let's see if it actually works. taken a while and there we go and would you look at that that is something so the good news is that actually worked all that's left is the color conversion to go from YCBCR to RGB however you might have noticed that took kind of a long time several seconds hopefully you've been screaming at me this whole time <laughs> 
not to do a quadruple nested for loop and all of these cosines every time. The truth is we can do a lot of optimization to this step. So that's what we're going to do next time. I think that's enough for now just to say we got the step done, even if the performance is less than ideal. So thanks for watching this to the end. Consider liking and subscribing if you're enjoying the series so far. And we'll continue this next time in Episode 6, Part 2.